Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to uh, the team at CCD COE. Um, thank you very much for Yak for his leadership um, over uh, many years. Um, it's great to be here in, in Tallinn and actually sort of getting out and meeting new people and, uh, and engaging on, on such fantastic topics. Um, one of the great things about traveling again is that you get to learn and understand and, uh, and speak to people. And it was great last night to see the walking tour of such a fantastic city. Um, and learning that, that in Estonian, you don't really say everything is good. You, you, you say everything is normal. So I think on behalf of cybersecurity um, uh, people across the entire world, I think we can all say that we're looking forward to another completely normal year. Um, but I think that we can safely say that with the current events around the world and what we've seen over the last couple of years, that's pretty much unlikely to happen. We've got a hot war where we can see an adversary who has, has no compunction for understanding or, or holding lines or, or attacking anything in the digital or physical space. Um, and we've seen vulnerabilities impact us globally that have had significant impact um, uh, on all of our systems. And it's against that backdrop that over the last couple of years in the UK, we've really been taking a good hard look at how is it that we transform and defend the cybersecurity of, of government as a sector? And how do we actually make a huge difference in the long term to actually making resilient and secure public services all the way from uh, the, the smallest systems in, in some of the um, departments and organizations all the way up to the national security apparatus. And we've started landing upon some of those key, key topics, which is really boiling down to what we think good looks like. And a lot of that actually has a lot of um, comparison with what you can see across NATO and other countries. Um, and that's what I'd like to talk about today. And if we sort of start looking back to how we've all thought about cyber conflict and defending ourselves, when I started sort of years ago back in the military, I was always thinking about, well, actually, conflict is, is a very physical, it's a very visceral thing. And then with the emergence of the cyber domain, then we all started thinking, well, it's actually the person at the back. It's the, it's the network defender that's going to make a massive difference. But everything we're seeing, and, and just from the sort of the, the great talk there from Nathaniel as well, is that this is now a blended thing. Um, and, and recent events really have underscored that, where we're seeing that actually, this isn't one or the other, it's actually both. And it's how we work together which is critical to this. And it's not those two actors, it's also the mix and blend across public and private sector. It's the mix between NGOs and it's how we work together to secure what it is that we are trying to achieve. And from the UK perspective, well, we, we had to sort of really take a good look at ourselves and, and actually try to work out what are our challenges what is it that we're really trying to, to fix here? And if you look across something the size and scale of, of, a, of a government and public sector at a national level, you'll see that the common challenges across many organizations, including the private sector, is that there's lots and lots of great work, but is it really joined up or is it slightly siloed? How do we get people to the point where actually they are actually working together and actually it's combined and a joint effort. And we had to actually look at our standards. We had a one size fits all standard. So oh, have you got this in place? Yes, fantastic. Is that really a case that, that is valid for going forwards? And also as well as, are we actually checking it and assuring that at scale? And that's a huge, huge challenge. We had massively different capabilities across the whole of the estate. Um, that were making it really difficult to actually combine efforts and join people up. And again, when you're looking at large-scale, long-term change, how do you measure progress over time? And this is a huge challenge for lots of organizations, be they um, in any sector. And it's really important to understand the context of what it is you're trying to achieve. You can't just develop a strategy. You can't just develop a policy or a new standard in isolation. You have to work out the context upon which you're developing it. So in the UK, we have the, the integrated review where it talks about it's not possible to 
predict or prevent every single risk. So actually, how do we improve our own ability to anticipate, prevent, prepare and respond to and recover from those realized risks? And we drew that down into the national strategy as well, where we talk about the resilience and defending um, all of our systems and promoting the capabilities internally of the UK of making a difference across the cyber domain. And we had to pull the thread through, through that international, international integrated review context all the way through the national strategy into the government cybersecurity strategy. Because when, it, when you look at the long-term change, you're really trying to help your um, workers, your um, personnel, understand how they sit in the bigger picture. They need to be able to pull the thread from where they are all the way up through the organization to the objectives of the organization. Because we need to keep that alignment and keep that vision going all the way forwards. Because this is a really complex area. And there's a fantastic quote by Frank Herbert in June, which talks about he, he who can destroy a thing controls a thing. Because this isn't just about securing data or services. This is about securing trust. And I think we tend to get slightly lost in the technology now and again. And actually, we've got to sort of lift, lift our heads and, and lift our eyes to actually some of the key challenge. Because across your customers, your clients, your citizens, they need to be able to trust what it is that we are doing. They need to be able to trust and understand that actually we are going to secure that trust all the way through because we can't let our adversaries destroy, weaken, or control it. It's not just about the technology. And the other, the, uh, other key thing that people always look at is from a government perspective, then it's really easy to um, sort of start driving change from the center. And actually, when you're sitting there going, right, we, we need to actually improve things. I love XKCD for, uh, for how standards proliferate. When people say, right, we have to actually improve, we need to cohere 14 standards. Before long, you have 15 standards, and everyone starts getting even more confused. So when we start looking at how do we drive and enable change, it's the approach that we took was a lot more of the build it and they will come rather than here is a new standard that we all have to follow. Because when you're looking at large scale change, if you can sell the vision to people, if you can sell the, the actual long term goal of how this is going to help them, how this is going to help their organizations, then they're more likely to come on that journey with you. And that's a much, much more engaged method than just imposing a new standard. Um, it's more of a carrot approach. There is always a balance to be had, though, because you need to have actually those clear guide the, the clear guidance and the challenge to be able to say to people, this is how we're going forward. So all the way through the development of the strategy, we also had an external challenge panel who, for when we as, as government were sitting down saying, right, actually, what are our ideas? How can we take this forward? We had an external challenge panel made up of industry, academia, and, and um, individuals from the think tank world that we could actually challenge us on how we were thinking. Because we don't want to end up in a place where we're adding complexity to a challenge which is already complex. And where we ended up um, with the government cybersecurity strategy is, is what we think is really fairly sort of simple and boiled down of, of the, some of those key challenges. The vision really speaks to that top level integrated review down through the national strategy into the cyber strategy. It's focused on the delivery of public services. It's focused on securing all of those services through national security and then strengthening the UK as a sovereign nation and cementing our um, uh, position as a democratic and responsible cyber power. That's our sort of capstone. And then how do we draw that down into the aim for the strategy itself? And this is where it can be really easy to try and boil the ocean of what you're trying to achieve on, a, on, on an aim such as this. But really, when it comes down to it, you're trying to be resilient against known bad. It can be too easy to turn around to your teams and say, be ready for anything. Define anything. So what we really focused on is, is the known bad. So we want to make sure that at scale, we can be resilient against known vulnerabilities, and known attack methods. Because we can teach our teams on that. We can build our processes. We can build our people 
based on actually managing the threats and vulnerabilities that are out there that we know about now. And, and you might be thinking, well, actually, how, how does that help you on the new stuff that lands? If you can manage all of those vulnerabilities and all of those threats quickly and at pace, then actually your teams, your people, and your processes will get you the rest of the way. And it gives you a lot of structure and it gives you a lot of um, timelines and metrics to be able to take that forwards. The other challenges that, that we had as we were going uh, through the strategy is that actually, when people talk about, right, we need to make change and drive change quickly, when we've proposed a, a timeline of out to 2030, so about eight years from now, people are saying, well, we must be able to do this quicker. But when you're looking at large-scale, long-term change and, this, and the scale of the challenge, we're not just looking at technological change, we're actually looking at cultural change. How do, we, how do we think about this problem and how do we develop our thinking to a place where actually we've built the people, the technology and the processes at scale across lots and lots of different organizations that are currently quite different in their approaches. This is all about developing that fixed point on the horizon. Because now and again, in the cybersecurity domain, with the technological challenges we're facing, it sometimes feels like we're running whilst we're looking at our feet. If we're looking at this through a long-term change perspective, we need that fixed point on the horizon that people can look at and people can uh, work towards throughout. Leadership will change. Organizations will change. It's maintaining the fixed point on the horizon that everyone knows how to get to. And then how it all fits together. We did keep it really simple. Um, and when it boils down to it, this is fully about having resilient, organizations, so that first pillar of build organizational cybersecurity resilience is the foundation of all of this. All of the great conversations we've seen over the last uh, day keep talking about the importance of resilience. And when we thought about actually the adversaries that we've got, we know that at some point we will have some strategic surprise. We know at some point organizations will have issues. So this is about making sure that we have resilience throughout um, uh, the, the, the entire estate. And I'll talk about the Defenders One piece in a second. But we broke this down to, we need organizations to be able to manage their security risk. And what does that look like? It's actually having the governance and the leadership in place and understanding what it is that they're actually defending. Being able to protect against cyber attack, actually having the elements in place to be able to understand not just where their assets are, but actually be able to protect those assets and protect those systems. The third reads to how do we detect, not just within the organizations, but also at scale. And that sometimes, if you look at the complexity of systems across something as large and complex as, for example, government or a public sector or any sector, that's actually really difficult to achieve. And objective four talks about when this goes wrong and actually attacks do happen, how do we minimize the impact of all of those events? Underpinned on all of this is skills, knowledge, and culture. That's as simple as we could boil down this challenge because for long-term change, that's the critical piece. And against all of those things, we can pull the thread from each one of those activities all the way up through the strategy, all the way up through the integrated review. So for a team, for an individual on the ground, they can completely situate themselves in what it is they're doing every single day. And if you also look at that effort, this isn't just about how does an organization achieve this, but it's how do we achieve this at scale, which comes back to the Defenders One piece. When we talk about detect, we're not just talking about, can an organization detect if there's um, an adversary on their network, but how do we detect at scale? How do we get the, the combination of all of those organizations working together so that we can actually collaborate a lot more? And some of, the, some of my sort of personal reflections on the journey is it's a real balance between scale and time scale. Smaller organizations can move in a really quite agile manner in this. But how do we do that with multiple sort of hundreds and thousands potentially of organizations? Because it can be really lost to get, cyber that, it, get, get lost in that noise when this is just about getting the foundation and bring clarity to what it is that we're trying to manage. 
And that's a really hard question sometimes for large and complex organizations. The simple question of who is responsible can be really hard at sector scale because that's the challenge that we're facing. It's not just organization, it's not just sectoral, but it's also national and then international as well because we're all partners with each other. It's understanding those overlaps it's understanding where the Venn diagram point touches everybody and what we can all commonly agree on that's critical. And then when we really start focusing on that resilience and that understanding, then it means that we get to the point where we can make cybersecurity resilience a really good and fantastic critical enabler of that strategic and operational freedom of movement. And it's engaging everybody from the technical operators all the way up to the senior leadership. And it's also worthwhile touching now on the, on the supply chain challenge. It's been one of those key topics that we all talk about um, and have been talking about sort of increasingly with some of the incidents that, that we've all seen. And, and the Ouroboros has a, a meaning of circular infinity because we've got to remember that the supply chain challenge is, is not a one-way flow down. We are all, because of the interconnectedness of the domain, in some way we are all both suppliers and customers if not in a commercial way, but also in a data sense. If you look at a government, if you look at a, a, a national systems, in some way, there is an interconnectedness. There is nothing that is really happening in isolation from everybody. So how we go forwards in tackling the supply chain is really collectively. This is a public-private partnership, really, in its, in its truest sense, across all of us. And also as well, when we're talking about resilience, and, and it's already been touched upon in previous conversations, is we have to be able to learn from others. As it was previously mentioned this morning, is, is learning from other sectors. And actually there's a huge amount of value in trying to learn from other sectors because they've already gone through this learning journey. How do we take their learning journey and actually apply it to ourselves? And key to that is, for me, the challenge we've seen around data, and it's making the most of the data that we've got out there. It's easy to drown in data in a way, but actually what we've really seen is, how do you, how do you learn once and do many times? So we've got lots of um, fantastic capabilities across the whole of the estate, but how do we get that data shared around the estate so that we learn every single time? It's not enough to learn from an incident. How do we learn from all of the events that are slightly below that waterline and we actually um, avoid incidents before they become accidents? And that's where, for example, we've got um, lessons from the counterterrorism world. So if somewhere within your nation there was information that could have potentially prevented a terrorist attack, the subsequent investigation will say that information should have been with the right person at the right time in order to disrupt it and stop it. In the cybersecurity world, it's the same. If somewhere within your organizations there was an information that could have stopped an attack, is it with that person? Is it in an actionable format? Can they do something about it and can they stop that attack? So this, this is really now starting to get to the, we can't try to defend in our stovepipes. We can't actually allow organizations to try and be resilient by themselves. This is how do we learn together? And it's starting to break down these barriers so that it's a, more of a collective defense, which then goes to some of the fantastic uh, efforts of NATO over the years. And then if you look at something like the aviation sector, in the aviation sector, there's an analogy of they never want to suffer the same accident twice. How do we learn at every single stage? How do we get our organization, how do we get our individuals to really take the, 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 ac the accidents, the incidents, the near misses, and share them, and discuss them, and chat through them, and learn from them so it doesn't happen again? And again, that value and that approach and that culture is something that we found really, really useful when it comes to cybersecurity. Because this really, really boils down to the people. So finding and hiring with diversity is absolutely critical to this. And that's not just in the, the, the conversations around 
trying to increase the gender balance across the, the cybersecurity world, but also of the skills that people have got there. Everything we've seen through, through the efforts that we've been getting engaged in is this challenge that we're trying to tackle. It goes right from the technical leadership and the, and the, uh, the, the analysts all the way up to the senior leadership within the organization. And it's a how do we actually train and educate and actually advise all the way through that entire spectrum. Because when we go back to that defenders one mindset, this isn't just across organizations, but within organizations. Is everybody in that organization really thinking about how they defend it and look after it? And everything that we've seen and discussed, and it's a, an ongoing challenge uh, around the world, is the rate and scale and increase of our cybersecurity challenges feels like we're never going to quite have enough people to, achieve, to actually tackle them. And if we start thinking about, well, if we're not going to have enough people, what does that do to our mindset? What can we do to actually make our life easier, to make the life easier for the teams on the ground, for the individuals that are trying to make a difference? How do we simplify their processes? It's already been touched upon about how do we automate and uh, actually make the signal from noise a lot easier. And also, we've got to empower them, and we've got to help them be creative. Because our adversaries are innovating all of the time, and Nathaniel actually touched upon that this morning. Their pace of um, innovation is significant. Rigid structures, rigid processes, and actually help is not going to help us going forwards. So how do we get our individuals to the point where actually they really can um, turn around and start giving up those, those fantastic and new ideas? And shifting this perception away from the human being being the weakest link to the human being being the, the strongest link in our organizations. This is not just about the technology, because this is about culture. It's the only thing that increases in value over time. So having had a look at the resilience um, and trying to improve, uh, look at how we re improve resilience across the UK, the next question is, how do we know that it's improving? And actually, how do we actually get to the point where we've got proportionate, realistic metrics that is improving at scale? And the way that we're looking to do this is, is something that we, we're calling sort of Govershaw. So this is really this, this single view of understanding risk at scale. And it's moving it to the point where it's tailored for threats, simplified, and, it's, and critically to this, it's objective. And it's also creating a natural feedback loop, again, trying to reduce the burden for the teams on the ground. And if we think about the pillars of what we're doing on the strategy of manage, protect, detect, and minimize, that's how we're going to be assessing the teams and the organizations out there. And as we measure them, we're actually doing it against a standardized framework that's already in existence, so it's not creating anything new. Um, and we create this feedback loop because we're assessing them against the pillars that are already in the strategy. So as time goes on, then actually we just get a, a steady feedback loop of whether we are actually making a difference or not. So it's about getting that um, steady and under, a steady build of understanding across the whole of the estate. And it's helping the organizations walk through this process to better understand themselves. But again, as we do this, this is not just about the organizations. This is about sector and national scale. So as they prioritize and they go through their, self, their own self-assessments, we've got objectivity, we've got order in there, and then a final assessment. The value of a single organization going through that, for them, is fantastic. The value of all your organizations going through that and then getting this sectoral vision and the sectoral view of where you are is the thing that makes a huge, huge difference for long-term planning, for long-term understanding of where your gaps are, for where your common challenges are. Because it's the common challenges that have to be fixed at a scale in working together. And we also really, really focused on how do we look at minimizing the impact of security incidents. Within your organizations, we, we talk about uh, the standard sort of prepare, respond, recover, and learn cycle. But how do you do that at national scale? How do you do that at sectoral scale? Because the challenge is slightly different. So the way that we're starting to approach this is typically you would look at doing a red team exercise on an organization, um, which really digs into threat-led 
Let's test the technology. Let's test whether the controls are working against this organization. But if you think about the reports that generally come out of things like that, they're quite technical. Are they engaged with uh, the senior leadership? Does it really relate to what the impact of that outcome or those outcomes could be? So we're getting to the point now where actually we'll do a red team exercise, we'll do a threat-led uh, penetration test, but then we're looking to flip the results of those exercises into, uh, of the technical exercises, into a tabletop exercise that involves the senior leadership. So the senior leadership then walk through and live the experience of what we've just found technically. They can contextualize those technical results into what it means for them as leaders of that organization. So that by the time we come off the engagement, then actually we're at a point now where technical teams have the same visibility and same understanding as the leadership teams. And we can start doing that at multiple scales. And this really now does start getting us into defending as one, because our attackers do not attack in stovepipes. We can't defend in stovepipes. So within and across organizations, I mean, the, the diagram here from XKCD was designed to talk about software supply chain challenges. In reality, this is what all of our sectors and large-scale organizations look like with our teams. We can't have people thinking in their blocks. We have to actually get people working together because then we'd get signal from noise at scale and a defensive force that is greater than the sum of the individual parts. And we're trying to take that forward by creating a cybersecurity coordination center that looks after us as a sector that can start coordinating across all of those different bits so that we can do this at scale and pace. Because across the technology that we have, the vulnerabilities we have are significant. We will always have the challenge of vulnerabilities out there. But it's not just your organization. So whenever we get a vulnerability or a large scale vulnerability, all of your organizations could have the same challenge. So if we really want to start defending as one, we need to start talking together. We need to start engaging across all of those organizations to see who's found a really good way to mitigate it and move on quickly. Because this is about doing this at scale and building that trust and engagement. And it's not just looking within your own organizations. We've already touched upon the value of working across industry and government, but the hacker and research community are fantastic at doing this sort of thing. And that's why building trust across all of those different partnerships and relationships is really, really critical. And it's the same when it comes to threats. How many threat actors will only attack one organization within your sector? Really, threat actors will go against multiple organizations within your sector. How do you actually get your organizations talking so that you can engage, find, and actually get that signal from noise again? And then this brings us across in a full circle through to deterrence. I mean, fantastic presentations yesterday talking about the challenges of deterrence. Whereas if we can really boil this challenge down of what it is we're trying to achieve at, at government and national level and also in private sector, if we really focus on the resilience, if we really focus on being able to defend as one, we get to the point where we get to potentially deterrence through defensive denial. We get the point where an adversary has so much effort that they need to try and expend that there is no such thing really as a campaign. There's an, a, an attempt at an achievement of an effect. We all talk, we all mitigate, and we all move forwards. It's about increasing risks and costs all the way through and reducing their ability for strategic surprise. Because fundamentally, with the interconnectedness of the domain, we are in this together and we can act together. So, it's been a fantastic journey over the last couple of years to try and transform how we think nationally around cybersecurity and cyber defense. Boiling it down to that focus on resilience, boiling it down to that focus on how do we defend as one? How do we defend across all of those organizations? How do we share data and how do we get ahead of the adversary? And that has so much applicability across national, international, and coalition as well. And we can make a difference. So um, thank you very much.